thanks again for the introduction. And thanks to you and your LifeSite team for bringing me to this important conference. Now, I'm honored today to be speaking to you on behalf of the Fatima Center. It's an apostolate founded by Father Nicholas Gruner, my friend and mentor, who dedicated his entire priestly career of almost 40 years to spreading the message of Fatima. I have a lot of fond memories of Father Gruner. I like to say that I acquired the equivalent of a master's degree in theology just listening to him over his kitchen table. Uh, but today, I don't come to you as a lawyer. I don't come to you as counsel to the Thomas More Society, nor am I to address you today about conflicts in the court over constitutional rights. The conflict that I'm here to talk about is far vaster than any skirmish in a courtroom. Of course, we're talking about what St. Paul said to the Ephesians when he warned them about the spiritual battle that is going on. What we are contending with today, obviously, is what he called the spirits of wickedness in high places. But never before have we seen those spirits in the high places at the very summits of the Holy Catholic Church. And I owe it to Father Gruner that I learned about the Fatima message and that I stand here today before you to address you concerning that subject. I remember what Cardinal Ratzinger once said of Father Gruner. He is un uomo serio, a serious man. And that he was. Now, the theme of this conference is an anti-globalist alliance, resetting the world in Christ. But the return, mutatis mutandis, of the social kingship of Christ over men and nations, that is the true great reset. As the late great Romano Amerio put it, faith in divine providence requires us to believe that while the world is incapable of a metanoia, that is, of initiating it itself, it would respond, and a great metanoia would happen if only the church would offer it. And one thinks of the miraculous reconversion of the Western world after the barbarian invasions and the fall of the Roman Empire. As Christopher Dawson observed, the current of divine grace runs beneath the desert of modernity and can reemerge again to bring forth new life in barren soil. And that, that brings us to the title of my talk, The Message of Fatima, The Great Reset in Christ. My thesis is simple. The requests of Our Lady of Fatima carried out in our individual lives and corporately in the church are precisely that invitation to social metanoia that can bring about the reconversion of former Christendom. The Mother of God did not waste words at Fatima. She did not give us pious platitudes but rather the prescription for a civilizational miracle that, as Antonio Sochi has observed, would dwarf even the momentous victory over Islam at the Battle of Lepanto. Now, by way of tactics, in the midst of the current unprecedented ecclesial crisis, there is, of course, resistance to the destructive novelties of the past 60 years, including the ones now emanating from this pope and his Vatican apparatus. And that resistance is not only necessary, but morally obligatory. But it will ultimately prove insufficient to bring about an ecclesial restoration without which the world cannot be saved from auto-destruction. As this disastrous pontificate is demonstrated, by every measure, things are too far gone in the church and correspondingly in the secular world. For any ecclesial movement of resistance, to succeed at anything more than preserving islands of sanity in the midst of an ecclesial sea of insanity. Precisely the situation in which opponents of the Arian heresy found themselves. But the message of Our Lady of Fatima, which with heavenly concision, sums up all the elements of the faith that have been suppressed in the current crisis, there we find a universal solution to that crisis behind which we should all unite our efforts, which is not in any way to diminish the work of the many excellent Catholic apostolates that reach particular constituencies in the church. But what is needed ultimately is a return of an ecclesial state of affairs in which there is only one constituency in the church, no longer conservative, liberal, and traditionalist constituencies, 
jockeying for position in the midst of this unprecedented confusion. Never before in church history have we seen such a tripartite division in the ecclesial commonwealth, but rather one integral constituency of the traditional Catholic faith in every aspect of what has been handed down since apostolic times. Only then can we say that the church has been restored as opposed to being treated here and there for the symptoms of a raging underlying disease that presently shows no signs of abating, but rather appears to be worsening on account of this pontificate. And here I would contrast the pontificate of Benedict XVI with the current disaster. With a few simple acts of governance, liberating the traditional mass from its absurd Babylonian captivity, lifting the excommunications of the bishops of the Society of St. Pius X, and correcting some of the more egregious mistranslations of the basic liturgical text of the Novus Ordo. With just those few acts of governance, Pope Benedict triggered the beginning of a massive restoration in the church. I remember going on pilgrimage in Europe to the places where the mass was absolutely forbidden, the mass of all times, and suddenly all the doors were open. It looked promising to us. It looked like the restoration had actually begun. But then he resigned. And what happened, I liken to the effect of not taking a full course of antibiotics. We had a rebound infection with this pope. And now the situation is worse than it ever was before. So I hope to convince you that all Catholic organizations and leaders should come together to promote the Fatima message in addition to their own contributions to the cause of restoration. For we stand at a crossroads. The situation in the church and the world as a whole is seemingly irremediable. If we each keep doing what we're doing, we'll win some victories. Perhaps we'll keep a Latin mass community alive, in spite of Francis. We'll save a traditional religious order from destruction. Maybe we'll avoid a synod that actually denies an article of divine and Catholic faith. Or in the secular realm, we might elect a good politician. We know who we're talking about. But we will not stop the downward trend we've been living through for more than 60 years. This is what Cardinal Ratzinger called a continuing process of decay since the Second Vatican Council. And what Our Lady of Fatima promised at Fatima is more than a holding action against an onslaught on every side by the barbarians. She promised to repel the barbarians and restore for such time as it pleases Christ the King for the advent of the Antichrist in the end days, the good order of the church, and peace in the world. The intercession of the mother of God is capable of nothing less. Let's talk briefly about this crisis, the twin crisis of church and state. I don't need to convince anyone in this room that in the church and consequently in the world, we now witness a state of affairs that can only be called apocalyptic. Not in the sense of the apocalypse, the end of history, but in the sense of a revelation, which is the root meaning of the word apocalypse, a revelation of things that are going on in the church and the world that have led to what seems to be a terminal state of decay. And that includes a synodal process centered in Rome, presided over by the Pope himself, that Cardinal Mueller has aptly described as a hostile takeover of the Church of Jesus Christ. Never, absolutely never, in church history has there been such a development. Now, when I hear the word synod, I think immediately of a nod to sin. <laughs> and when I think of the theme of the synod, that ditty by the Beatles comes to mind. All we are saying is give sin a chance. <laughs> That's what the synod is literally all about. Again, never have we seen any such thing in the history of the church. Now, of course, we've known that since Vatican II, priests and religious are dying off. There are a few vocations to replace them. The sacramental lives of Catholics have imploded. Catholic marriages and baptisms have fallen off a cliff. At the outset of the council, 75% of my fellow Americans went to Mass each week. Today, only 17% do. And among the very few who attend Mass each week, these are the ones that still practice the faith, almost half don't believe in the real presence of our Lord in the Eucharist. 
we might find the faith intact in our own ecclesial lifeboats in the tossing seas of a neo-modernist insurrection that dwarfs even the Aryan crisis in its depth and breadth. But what about the rest of the mystical body? And then there is this pontificate. Dramatic pause. A quantum leap in the process of ecclesial decoherence remarked by Cardinal Ratzinger. To say that Francis has been harmful to the church is almost to trivialize his calamitous impact on the ecclesial commonwealth. To all appearances, he is determined to leave no aspect of the historical church recognizable or even recoverable by the end of his pontificate. How many times have we heard boasting on his behalf that he intends to make changes that cannot be reversed? Now, if that claim seems extravagant, let Francis indict himself. Quoting Yves Congar, here's what he said. There is no need to create another church, but to create a different church. But isn't a different church another church? This is modernist double talk by, let us face it, a pope who fits the definition of a modernist. Now, we've grown somewhat numb to the repeated shocks to the mystical body that this pope has administered. But before Francis arrived on the scene, who among us could have imagined a pope who would, one, reduce the negative precepts of the Decalogue, including the Sixth Commandment to a set of rules from which one can be excused based on concrete circumstances. Is there anyone whose life doesn't involve concrete circumstances in the audience here? I'd like to know. We all have concrete circumstances. That's a recipe for situation ethics. Secondly, opens wide the door to Holy Communion for those in adulterous unions. Third, incessantly denounces faithful Catholics as rigid ideologues. At the same time, he honors those who attack Catholic teaching on marriage, family, on natural vice, and so forth, with personal audiences, letters of praise, and photo ops. He hands millions of the faithful in the underground church over to their persecutors in communist China. He sided with governments worldwide when they denied the Catholic faithful access to the mass and other sacraments in response to a flu-like illness. And he demanded that the faithful submit to experimental vaccines, which, as we all know, have proven to be worse than useless. And we've seen that he participates in the worship of pagan idols in St. Peter's Basilica while proposing to create new rites of mass with pagan elements. He targets traditional religious societies for commissioning and then destruction. And the most hubristic attempt of all, he seeks to abolish the traditional approved and received rite of mass in the Holy Catholic Church of apostolic origin and has nurtured Council of Saints and is the liturgical foundation of Christendom, which none other than Luther labored to destroy because he knew that if he conquered that mass, he could conquer the power of the papacy. Now we have a pope who seems determined to conquer the power of the papacy himself while abusing it in unprecedented ways. He attempts to promote the institutional toleration and even acceptance of so-called unions based on adultery, fornication, and sodomy, thereby negating in practice moral precepts revealed by God himself. He appoints as a doctrinal chief, a man whose chief claim to fame is a book entitled, Heal Me With Your Mouth, The Art of Kissing. He harnesses the church, this is the most annoying to me, in spite of everything else, to the insanity of the climate change religion, uttering patently ridiculous pronouncements on the environment in which he has no competence whatsoever. Now, the entire program of this immensely destructive pontificate can be summed up in Francis's recent statements to an Argentinian interviewer. Quote, the church has to change. That's theological progression of moral theology and all the ecclesiastical sciences, even in the interpretation of scriptures that have progressed according to the feelings of the church, end quote. That's the essence of the modernist heresy. Everything must change. Into what? Well, we don't know. We never know where we're going till we get there. 
but we never get there. Romano Romero called this mobilism, the endless pursuit of some end state that's constantly dangled in front of us like the proverbial carrot on a stick. Meanwhile, everything about us is changed in the name of change for the sake of change. Again, the essence of modernism. Now, past generations of Catholics might have risen up against such a pope. But present company and a few other groups and individuals accepted, most people just go on with their lives, they shrug their shoulders, or they think Francis is just wonderful. But we would be mistaken if we were to lay the blame for this situation on Francis alone, or even largely on Francis. We know that the current state of the church has been long in the making. It is the fruit of Freemasonry, Protestantism, atheistic communism, and above all within the church, modernism, all culminating in what, as Cardinal Sunin's famously admitted, was the French Revolution in the church. We heard talk of the catacombs pact. You know, the French revolutionaries had a secret pact called the tennis court oath. So there's an eerie parallel there. But take a look at the text of the catacombs pact in which they make various promises to themselves about how they're going to bestow riches and privileges. I think there are 12 or 13 items. They haven't done a blessed one of those things. They've retained their privileges and their power, which they continue to abuse. The oath was an empty show. It was a bonfire of the vanities. Now, this pontificate, therefore, is just the consequence, the logical consequence of a revolutionary new theology, a new morality, and overall, a new orientation now ascendant within much of the human element of the church, even at her very summits. Turning to the world, as in the church, the crisis in the world is devastating and horrific. Once Christian nations have suffered a complete loss of morality, modesty and decency are all but non-existent. Pornography, contraception, abortion, Homosexuality, transsexuality, and human trafficking are normalized. Occult and satanic practices are on the rise, unchecked by the law or public sentiment. Our societies are more divided than ever before. Every public institution is decayed and on the verge of collapse. Education, health care, the media, government, undocumented immigrants pour into Europe and North America by the millions. And here's a paradox. Open borders for the illegal alien, increasing restrictions on travel by you and me. The free money strategy threatens to result in the ultimate economic collapse. So once derided as a, a right-wing conspiracy theory, the Great Reset is now openly championed by the most godless of men, unelected, unanswerable to no one, the deep state that has indicted Donald Trump four times on nonsense, on made-up crimes, and also has him on trial in a civil court where a crazy judge in Manhattan thinks he can divest the entire Trump empire after a bench trial in which no victims appeared. So the agenda here is the consolidation of global power, murderous depopulation, the reduction of all of us to the condition of digital, digitalized serfs. Ushering in the earthly paradise of perfect carbon neutrality. <laughs> now, as Pope Benedict admitted in his Christmas greetings of 2010, our situation today echoes that of the Roman Empire at the moment of its fall. As he said, moral consensus is collapsing. Consensus without which juridical and political structures cannot function. Consequently, this is key, the forces mobilized for the defense of such structures, including us, seem doomed to failure. And if all that seems remote to you and incredible, war upon us is in Eastern Europe and the Middle East. And both of these conflicts have the potential to become a global conflagration we now stand on the precipice of World War III. So, we know that in church and state, if we're honest with ourselves, we've reached, humanly speaking, the point of no return. A new pope, such as Francis, Francis II, which God forbid, a new president, a new prime minister, a new political program, 
will not reverse the terminal decline. What we need is what can only be called a miracle, divine intervention. God alone can resolve the state of affairs that has resulted from apostasy within and without the church. But our God is good. From all eternity, he saw the unprecedented calamities that now beset both church and state. In response, he sent the Blessed Virgin Mary to three shepherd children in Fatima, in Portugal, in 1917. While things are too far gone for a human solution, it is never too late to have recourse to our Lord through his Blessed Mother. And that is the offering to the church by God himself at Fatima. Now, time doesn't permit me to go over all the momentous events of the Fatima story in the year 1917. Yeah, before you some literature which has been provided to you, a pamphlet entitled Fatima in Brief. I hope you'll use that literature to acquaint yourself to the subject, to the extent that you don't know about it, and try to obtain that literature for others as well. But suffice it to say for present purposes that in the course of six apparitions, to the three visionaries, Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta, between May 13 and October 13, 1917, Our Lady delivered a message even more relevant and urgent today than it was on the cusp of the Bolshevik Revolution and the spread of Russia's errors throughout the world in the run-up to World War II. Now let's dispense at the outset the objection that Fatima is just a private revelation that one can take or leave. The facts of history and the hierarchical approbation of the Fatima message long ago surpassed that objection. Let's remind ourselves of a few points. The visionaries were arrested by the Masonic mayor of Orem, jailed and threatened with immediate execution if they did not recant what they had seen and heard from the Virgin. They refused. That is not the behavior of liars. Rather, it seems to me to be an imitation of the apostles themselves who went to their death rather than deny that they had seen the resurrected Lord. As if that were not enough to authenticate the apparitions and convince even the unbelieving, as we know, Our Lady promised a miracle on the 13th of October, 1917, at noon solar time, the first and only scheduled miracle in salvation history. And the 70,000 people who assembled to witness the miracle of the sun were not disappointed. They, along with others who were miles away from the COVID area, saw the sun whirl about in the sky, a fire wheel, bathing the landscape in colors, and then plunging toward the earth as if it were going to incinerate everyone, instantly drying the muddy ground of the COVID area, which had been drenched with rain, and the clothing of the witnesses. They were instantaneous cures and conversions. But here is the ultimate certification. Hollywood made a movie about it. <laughs> Even Hollywood had to recognize this is not some forgotten little private revelation, but a world historical event. Since then, the church's hierarchy has formally and consistently approved the authenticity of the Fatima apparitions. This includes local bishops, Portugal's bishops, and of course the popes. Francisco and Jacinta were canonized. They're the youngest Catholic saints who were not martyrs. And the process for Lucia's canonization is underway. All the popes since 1917 have endorsed the authenticity of the apparitions and the Fatima message. And in 2010, on his pilgrimage to Fatima, here is what Pope Benedict XVI said about it. He deceives himself who thinks that the prophetic mission of Fatima is concluded. So Benedict certainly did not view Fatima as a private revelation. And in 2010, during that same pilgrimage, when asked about the third secret of Fatima, and this was a question he pre-selected to be posed to him on the airplane during the flight to Portugal. Here is what he said about the secret. Beyond the circumstances of John Paul II, other realities are indicated, which over time will develop and become clear. In terms of what today we can discover in this message, attacks against the Pope of the Church don't come just from outside the Church. The suffering of the Church also comes from within the Church, because sin exists in the Church. This too has always been known, 
but today we see it in a really terrifying way, in modo verif veramente terrificante. The greatest persecution of the church doesn't come from enemies on the outside, but is born in sin within the church. The church thus has a deep need to relearn penance, to accept purification, to learn on one hand forgiveness, but also the necessity of justice. Forgiveness does not exclude justice, hardly the message of this ridiculous synod. We have to relearn the essentials, he said, conversion, prayer, penance, and the theological virtues. So if I, as I've shown you, Benedict sees in the message of Fatima precisely a heavenly warning about the consequences of the abandonment so plainly evident in the ridiculous synodal process of the very fundamentals of the Catholic faith. And when I get to the vision in more detail, the vision of the third secret about which he was questioned, you'll see exactly why there's much more to the third secret of Fatima than we've been led to believe. I also recall here the admission of John Paul II in crossing the threshold of hope, in which he admitted that preaching a catechesis on the last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell, they've been abandoned in the post-conciliar epic, and the church's ministers have, quote, lost the courage to preach the threat of hell. In other words, they've lost the courage to save souls. That's essentially what he admitted. And instead of the eschatology of the individual soul, its fate, eternal damnation, or eternal felicity in the company of God, what we now have, as John Paul II admitted in the same interview, is a kind of communal eschatology, the people of God on pilgrimage. And he says that in this nebulous eschatology, the individual does indeed get lost. But it's all about the salvation of the individual soul. That is the mission of the church, to save souls from hell. And that is why Our Lady came to Fatima. None of this, of course, is of any interest to the synodiacs, as I call them, chattering around their bingo tables. I get that reference to John Rowell's highly perceptive wife, who says, doesn't this look like somebody playing bingo at a church basement? <laughs> now, on the contrary, as Cardinal Mueller warns us, their chattering in Aula Paolo Sesto is preparing the way for the acceptance of homosexuality and women's ordination. To quote the Cardinal, all is being turned around so that now we must be open to homosexuality and the ordination of women. If you analyze it, all is about converting us to these two themes. This is what's happening at the very summit of the church. So Fatima is no private revelation. It's a public prophetic revelation, as Father Gruner called it, concerning precisely the situation in church and state that now confronts us. Now, the essence of the Fatima message, what is it? It's something that the itching ears of the synodiacs don't want to hear. The horror of sin, its temporal and eternal consequences, and the means of averting the worst of those consequences. Global chastisement in this life, and eternal damnation in the next through acts of reparation to be practiced by each individual and by the church universal. As Cardinal Mueller told us in his devastating summary of the just concluded synod, they're changing the definition of sin. There are no sins for some of them. There are only wounded people. They're not sinners, they're wounded people, wounded by the church, by the doctrine of the church. But of course, there are still some sins that this pope recognizes and condemns. For example, the failure to recycle, <laughs> using too much air conditioning, and refusing the COVID vaccination. So at Fatima, Our Lady made it clear that sin is real and hell is real. She showed children a vision of hell, and as Lucia put it, if that hadn't been cut short, they would have died of fright just looking at what they had been shown. So given those realities, Our Lady issued an admonition that the synodiacs seemed determined to consign to oblivion. People must amend their lives and ask pardon for their sins. 
They must not offend our Lord anymore, for he is already too much offended. Now, this need for true conversion in the face of impending divine wrath, anathema to the post-conciliar mentality, is what lies at the heart of the message of Fatima. It's also a major theme throughout scriptures in the life of the church. Consider St. John the Baptist, Jonah and the Ninevites, and the reforms of Cluny, St. Francis, St. Dominic, and so on. Repentance and acts of reparation and petition, not synods, and what the Mother of God delivered for the welfare of souls, the good of the church, and the rescue of the world from its headlong rush into what Pope Leo XIII prophetically described as final disaster. So let us recall what the message of Fatima prescribes for the salvation of souls and the rescue of the world from a richly deserved chastisement. First of all, obviously, the rosary. In all six apparitions, Our Lady asked the children to pray the rosary. She asked the same of us. Pray the rosary every day. Our Lady revealed to Sister Lucia that in our times, the rosary has been given special efficacy. We know about the Battle of Lepanto and the role the rosary played in that miraculous triumph. Perhaps you've read of the siege of Vienna in which the chaplain of the Holy League, Father Mario Daviano, told the forces fighting against Islam to pray the rosary. And they had a miraculous victory, repelling Islam from Europe, ending the military threat by Islam to the European mainland until our present time. And in modern times, we see the inexplicable exit of the Soviets from Eastern Austria in 1955, an example of the special efficacy of the rosary in our times. To this day, historians and political scientists cannot explain why the Soviets packed up and left Eastern Austria. Perhaps it had something to do with a million people engaging in a rosary rally for the expulsion of the Soviets. Now, in the church, Somorum Pontificum was issued after a rosary crusade involving more than a million rosaries, as was the lifting of the excommunications of the bishops of the Society of St. Pius X. The power of the rosary surpasses all interventions by human movements alone, no matter how nobly intended those movements are. Secondly, the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Devotion to the Immaculate Heart. During the apparition of June 13, 1917, Our Lady enveloped the children in a great light of grace and revealed to them her Immaculate Heart, pierced by many thorns, representing the sins of humanity. Our Lady said, God wills to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. To whoever embraces this devotion, I promise salvation. These souls shall be dear to God as flowers placed by me to adorn his throne. And here, too, we encounter an element of Catholic piety that is anathema to the post-conciliar mentality and the so-called synodal church. The fulfillment of the Fatima prophecy lies precisely in the triumph of the Immaculate Heart over the powers and principalities that dominate the world and have infiltrated the church in our time. And that means nothing other than the return of the social kingship of Christ the King. In my book, Liberty of the God That Failed, I write about a group of Protestants in the 1860s who proposed to amend the Constitution to make an explicit recognition of the social kingship of Christ. They wanted the preamble of the Constitution to say that the will of Christ is the revealed law of the land. If you read the proceedings of the conventions that these Protestants attended, including a retired Supreme Court justice, Some of the statements in them could have been written by Leo XIII himself. That proposal was presented to President Lincoln, but it died in committee in Congress, so the process for constitutional amendment never got underway. Even Protestants could recognize the necessity of the social kingship of Christ over the corporate existence of men and nations. And that is what the triumph of the Immaculate Heart is all about. Next, the need for reparation. Devotion to the Immaculate Heart is inseparable from the concept of reparation by means of personal penance and public reparatory acts. The reality of sin means not only that we must stop sinning, we have to repair the damage done by sin for the glory and honor of God. 
We must make reparation not just for our own sins, but for the sins of others. And who knows how many catastrophes have already been averted by the penances and reparatory acts of a relatively few souls in a convent somewhere or in a monastery somewhere. But imagine the effects of concerted acts of reparation by millions of Catholics led by the Pope and the bishops. Christ's death is the greatest act of reparation ever offered on behalf of humanity, obviously. And Our Lady was perfectly united to our Lord and His sacrifice, and she offered her life, her very life, as an act of reparation. So prayer and penance are the means by which each of us can offer to make reparation. But when Sister Lucia asked our Lord what penance might be offered, there was no reference to hair shirts or starving yourself, but simply fulfilling the duties of state. That is the penance. And it may not seem like much, but given the pervasive madness afflicting the world today, it takes heroic virtue just to dress and act modestly, to profess true doctrine and fulfill one's duty to one's family. And that simple prescription is a far cry from the minds of the Synodiacs, who seem intent on eliminating the very concept of sin and penance and reducing the commandments to mere desiderata, more or less capable of achievement, depending on one's circumstances. And we read in the truly condemnable document, Amoris Laetitia. Now, we arrive here at the core of the message, the great secret of Fatima. Of all the apparitions of Our Lady in 1917, the one with the greatest import on events today was the apparition of July 13, 1917, which was later authenticated by the miracle of the sun. During that apparition of July 13, Our Lady revealed the great secret of Fatima, which consists, as we know, of three parts. The first part was the vision of hell that I've already mentioned. And of this, Our Lady said, you have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. In the second part of the secret, we have the familiar prophecy that if people do not cease offending God, then the world will be punished by means of war, hunger, and persecution of the church and the Holy Father. That happened, and it's happening today. Our Lady predicted that World War I would end, but that if humanity continued to offend God, a worse war would break out, and that was, of course, World War II. But she promised that she would return to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. And she said in a conditional prophecy, if my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. Of course, we're seeing these prophecies play out in our times, except for the annihilation of various nations. That would obviously be the ultimate consequence of failing to heed Our Lady's prescriptions. And in a moment, I'll show how the vision that the Vatican published pertaining to the third secret seems to pertain to that ultimate consequence. Now, the second part of the great secret ended with a certain prophecy, not conditional, but certain. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, which will be converted, and a period of peace will be granted to the world. We await the fulfillment of those promises. They will happen when Russia is consecrated to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. And that will mean the return of Russia to the unity of the Catholic Church. The mystic and poet Soloviev predicted there would be a great war. The East versus the West, during which Russia would indeed reunite with the Catholic Church and the schism of more than a thousand years duration would be ended. And that prophecy of Solovia was issued at the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century. And that will be the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. And we know that it will happen because the Mother of God promised that it will. The only question is when it will take place and what the state of the world will be when it happens. Will a pope conduct the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary at the edge of a blast crater that used to be Rome? We don't know. But we obviously have yet to see anything that could reasonably be called the triumph of the Immaculate Heart in the world. 
We know Our Lady's request for the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays in the consecration of Russia have not been fulfilled in the manner that heaven expects. Regarding that consecration, I'm reminded of Father Gruner's reference to the story of Naaman, the Syrian general, of whom we read in the Book of Kings, chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. God laid a simple command on Naaman through his prophet, bathe seven times in the river Jordan and your leprosy will be cured. Not six times, seven times. Not the river you prefer, which you think is better than the muddy river Jordan, but the river Jordan, seven times in the river Jordan. He tried to substitute another river. He was not cured. This prophet said in essence, what have you got to lose? Why don't you just listen to what the prophet says? And on the seventh immersion from bathing in the Jordan River, Naaman's leprosy was cured. And what does this scriptural lesson teach us? It says that when heaven makes a request, you do what heaven requests. You don't insert your interpolations. You don't substitute a river. You don't substitute a nation or a thing. You do exactly what God has requested. And at Fatima, he requested the consecration of Russia, nothing else, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, by the Pope, in union with all the Catholic bishops who are commanded to participate in a solemn public ceremony. The consecration of Russia, and Russia alone, not the world, not all of humanity, not youth in search of meaning, as one of the formulae for John Paul II's several attempts mentioned, but simply and only Russia. Incredibly enough, on at least 14 occasions, since 1942, the popes have failed to carry out heaven's directive in just the manner that the mother of God specified. In 1989, an anonymous Vatican memo asserted John Paul II had fulfilled Our Lady's request in 1984. Everybody was told to support the party line. This, despite the fact that after the consecration, John Paul II himself acknowledged that Our Lady was still awaiting the consecration she had requested. Let's look at the history of John Paul II's attempts. Well, I'll go back a little further. In 1942, just to give you the, the history of these attempts, Pius XII consecrated the whole of humanity, not what was requested. He did mention the people of Russia in Sacro Virgente Anno, an apostolic letter, but there was no public ceremony, and the bishops did not participate. In 1981 and 1982, John Paul II consecrated the whole human race, not Russia. In 1984, he consecrated men and nations who are in special need of this entrustment and consecration, no mention of Russia. In 2000, he consecrated, get this, all people, babies yet born, those in poverty and suffering, youth in search of meaning, the unemployed, those suffering hunger and disease, troubled families, the elderly, all who are alone, and without help. I remember saying to a friend of mine at the time, they should just do an omnibus ceremony at the Vatican in which they say, we hereby consecrate absolutely everything in the world except Russia. <laughs> so I ask myself, by what perverse mystery of iniquity has pope after pope failed or refused to do what heaven requested? And then we come to Francis. We all thought, at last, the Pope has announced he's going to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart, and the bishops will join him. And this will be, at long last, paradoxically enough, from this destroyer Pope, fulfillment of Our Lady's simple request at Fatima. Drum roll. And then on the day of, here's what we hear. Therefore, Mother of God and our Mother, to your immaculate heart, we solemnly entrust and consecrate ourselves, the church, and all humanity, especially Russia and Ukraine. No, no, no. Russia gets an honorable mention at the end of another laundry list. Why? Why? What explains this resolute failure. And isn't it curious, by the way, that every time one of these ceremonies is done, they tell us the consecration has been effected. Then they turn around and try again. 
And then they tell us the consecration is done. And then they turn around and try again. I count some, something like 14 attempts. And this most recent one, let's just say it's a double when we need a home run. I was more optimistic about it. I thought, well, I mean, there is a mention of Russia, even though it's an honorable mention, along with other things. Uh, let's see what happens. Let's see what the fruits are. And the fruits are World War III, essentially. That's heaven's answer to that latest fumbled attempt. So our, our Lord told Sister Lucia that he would not bring about Russia's conversion without Russia's specific consecration, precisely because it had to be acknowledged as having been effected through the mediation of the Immaculate Heart, so that devotion to it would be facilitated worldwide. Everyone would see that Russia, having been consecrated to the Immaculate Heart, underwent a miraculous conversion. There would be no doubt of the matter. As with the miracle of the sun, no one would have to tell anyone that a miracle had occurred. Like the 70,000 who saw that miracle, they knew it, and no one could tell them otherwise. But today, a disbelieving, sin-entrenched humanity will clearly have to see nothing short of a miraculous cause and effect in order to believe in the efficacy of the intervention of the Mother of God. And so heaven still awaits the consecration of Russia, and Russia alone. Which brings me to the third secret of Fatima. This is the third part of the great secret, which has come to be known as the third secret. Now, the Vatican on June 26, 2000, disclosed an enigmatic vision. And in the vision, we see the following. In a half-ruined city, we see a pope barely escaping alive. He makes his way to the top of a hill, leaving behind a city filled with the dead. At the top of the hill, he kneels before a cross made of cork bark. Curious detail. And while he's kneeling there, he is assassinated by a group of soldiers who fire bullets and arrows at him. I'm reminded of Einstein's remark that the next world war, after the third world war, will be fought with bows and arrows because regular weapons will have been destroyed. So th that's a quite detailed account of the execution of a fu future pope. And in the same vision, Lucia explains that we saw a figure in white. We had the impression that it was the Holy Father, only to say later on, that the Holy Father is executed. Are there two bishops dressed in white residing in the Vatican at the time this prophecy is fulfilled? Now, what do we know about the problem with this vision? There isn't a single word of explanation by the Blessed Virgin Mary. She explained something as obvious as hell to the three seers. They knew what they were looking at, but she said to them, you have seen hell, the souls of poor sinners go. Nothing, not a word from Our Lady by way of explanation of this enigmatic vision. But we were told that Cardinal Sodano would interpret it for us. The scandal-ridden Vatican prelate would be the Oracle of Fatima. Now, the fact that they had to drag in Cardinal Sodano to explain this vision is evidence alone, I would say Exhibit A, that something is obviously missing. And what is missing? It's the words of the Virgin that follow what Sister Lucia wrote down in her fourth memoir. Quote, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved ellipses. When asked about that telltale phrase, which is obviously the beginning of the Virgin's explanation of what happens to dogma in the rest of the church, Cardinal Bertone said, well, in my opinion, I think it pertains to the second part of the secret events in the 20th century, to which anyone with any perception would immediately say, what do you mean in your opinion? Didn't you ask Sister Lucia what the Virgin said after etc.? Of course he did, and of course he knows the answer, and of course he's never going to tell us the answer. He was never going to tell us because the answer is not what they want us to hear. So, let no one lend any credence to Cardinal Sedano's ludicrous contention that the vision of a pope being executed outside a ruined city filled with the dead signifies John Paul II 
escaping death at the hands of a lone assassin in the perfectly intact city of Rome. Recall what Benedict said 13 years ago. I return to that quote. The secret, he said, regards future events, which over time will develop and become clear. And it relates to the reality that the worst attacks on the church come from within, because of sin within the church, as to which there is no reference whatsoever in the vision, standing alone. So where did he get this insight? He obviously got it from the words that follow in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved. I don't have the time to go through 33 reasons that I've compiled, or 101 reasons to doubt the Vatican's account and to reach the conclusion to a moral certainty that there is a text in which the Virgin explains this vision. Not Cardinal Sodano, but the Mother of God. And what does the angel in the vision of the third secret declare three times as flames of destruction emanate from his sword? Flames which the Virgin repels, but not before the destruction we see. He says one word three times, penance, penance, penance. And what did Cardinal Ratzinger say as Pope Benedict on his pilgrimage to Fatima regarding the third secret? It's time to relearn the basics of the faith, he says. The secret is a warning about sin within the church. We need to learn the necessity of conversion and penance and the justice of God. All of that is in the text we haven't seen, I am convinced. And in the 13 years that have elapsed, since Pope Benedict's revelations concerning the secret, do we not find confirmation that as Cardinal Luigi Chiappi, the papal theologian to five different popes, revealed, quote, in the third secret we read, among other things, that the great apostasy of the church begins at the top. And I believe that question answers itself. And if you look at later apparitions, we have to consider Apparitions after those of 1917. On December 10th, 1925, Our Lady appeared to Sister Lucia in Ponte Vedra, Spain, promising to assist at the moment of death with all the graces necessary for salvation those who practice the first Saturday devotion. Receive Holy Communion, recite five decades of the rosary, keep her company for 15 minutes while meditating on the 15 mysteries of the rosary, with the intention of making reparation to me. On June 13, 1929, she appeared to Sister Lucia and Tui to say that the moment has come in which God asks the Holy Father to make, in union with all the bishops of the world, the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart, promising to save it by this means. Another subsequent apparition sheds light on God's deadline, for lack of a better word. In August of 1931, our Lord appeared to Sister Lucia while she was praying in a chapel at Rianjo, Spain. And he said to her, make it known to my ministers that given they follow the example of the king of France in delaying the execution of my command, they will follow him into misfortune. He was referring to the request made to the French kings in 1689 by him to Sister Margaret Mary Alacoque to publicly consecrate France to his sacred heart. 100 years later to the day, the king of France was stripped of his authority, later to be executed as the French Revolution spread violence and terror throughout the oldest sister of the church. And I ask whether God in his mercy has issued a second 100-year warning at Fatima. We're fast approaching the 100th anniversary of the request for the first Saturday devotion, December 10, 2025. And the 100th anniversary of the request for the consecration of Russia, June 13, 2029. There are exactly three and a half years between those two dates. And we all know the apocalyptic implications of the time frame three and a half years, the time of the tribulation and the length of our Lord's public life. So we're late, we're very late in obeying our Lord's commands. This is why the message is so urgent right now. Terrible events are unfolding before our eyes, the likes of which the church has never witnessed. But to recall what our Lord told Sister Lucia, it is never too late to have recourse to Jesus and Mary. Which brings us to a plan of action. 
In conclusion, it should be apparent just from these brief indications that the Fatima message is heaven's solution, the solution for the crisis now besetting us. It's never too late to have recourse in Jesus and Mary, but we must act now. As we have seen, Our Lady prophesied that the message would be fulfilled and that her immaculate heart would triumph. While that ultimate outcome is assured, how terrible will be the spiritual and physical chastisements we have to endure before then? How many souls and lives will be lost? Consider the apparitions of Akita, the sister Sasagawa, whom I met in Japan. The essence of that apparition was the warning. If men do not change their ways, fire will rain down from heaven and destroy a great part of humanity. The living will envy the dead. Cardinals will oppose cardinals. Bishops will oppose bishops. Altars will be sacked. And priests who are faithful to their vocation will be persecuted. When asked about that vision by the Philippines ambassador to the Vatican, then Cardinal Ratzinger said, it's essentially the same as the message of Fatima. Now, the mystery of relation between grace and free will means that it does depend on us to participate in the activities that would avoid that ultimate catastrophe. And what does that mean, practically speaking? Obviously, number one, cease offending God and amend our lives. At a maximum, that means avoiding mortal sin, remaining in the state of grace. Secondly, pray the rosary every day. And if you're not doing that, at least, you're AWOL, a deserter. And I speak as someone who had to live how many years? Decades before I developed the habit. That's the minimum we can do. Consecrate yourself, thirdly, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Pray and sacrifice. Make whatever sacrifice you can for the intention that the Pope and bishops consecrate Russia as requested by heaven. Wear the brown scapular faithfully. I know that we all do. And live chastely according to your state in life. You can recite the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary, if, if not the rosary. Offer prayer and penance. Perform your daily duties cheerfully. Don't run from your obligation to your family. Do what has to be done. Next, practice the first Saturday devotion. Do it at least five times. And tell others to do it at least five times, thereby fulfilling Our Lady's request. The Fatima Center is issuing a first Saturday challenge to Catholics all over the world. A spiritual bouquet for the completion of 100,000 five first Saturdays by the 100th anniversary of her request for that devotion, December 10, 2025. Now, we can't force the Pope and the bishops to properly consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart, but we can help fulfill Our Lady's forgotten Fatima request, as some call it, for the completion of the first Saturday devotion. Fatima Center is going to establish a web page in which you can register the completion of five first Saturdays in support of that campaign. After you finish five for yourself, try to get others to do five first Saturdays. And visit Fatima.org. Around the beginning of Advent, there's going to be a website for you to obtain the information for that practical activity. <laughs> Lastly, someone outside the hall pointed out that intrinsic to the message of Fatima is that of family. So the seventh prescription, I would say, is to the younger among us, have many children. I've been on radio shows, podcasts, video presentations, and I reach out to Catholics and Protestants alike. And one thing I'm, I'm always at pains to say is, listen, if you are practicing any form of contraception, you have absolutely no right to complain about the outcome of any election. Because if you had five kids or six kids or seven kids at the time you were able to do so, the Democrats could never win an election. <laughs> So don't tell me your tale of woe about the outcome of politics when you have two children. When I was a practicing attorney, people would come into my office when I had a general practice, not the religious liberties work I've been doing since the early 90s. And they would, they would have bankruptcy problems, financial problems of all kinds. And I would say to them, here's the way you do this, not chapter 13. Have more children, and then you will have more money. They would look at me like I was crazy, but I, I, I felt I had a duty to tell them that. 
have children. That's the seventh and final prescription. Repopulate the world with Catholics and watch the world begin to renew itself again. So, to end this, by carrying out these acts of devotion and reparation and urging others to do so, we will help merit the graces needed for the Church to establish worldwide devotion to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart through the consecration of Russia, the consequent triumph of her Immaculate Heart, the true and integral restoration of the Church, and peace in the world. In the end, Our Lady's Immaculate Heart will indeed triumph. My only hope is that we will all live to see it. Thank you, and God bless you.